Italians. They just make good. Hi, my name is Dan Burroughs. I'm with Stinger Chemical. I've been in the industry since 1998 now. The industry that we're in right now is so different than it used to be because there's so much more technology and so much more advancement in the way the chemicals work, but they're also keeping up with the fact that the paints change, the interiors change, so it's pretty exciting and cool to be in this industry now because of all those things. It wasn't always that way. In the past, things were much easier, much different. There wasn't the selection of chemicals that we have now, so I find it interesting every day to see different things done, different results, different advancements. Things now, way more fun than they were back then. The classes that we do are always geared towards a couple different things. The goals are always to speed up productivity, to keep a high level of quality, but more than anything to educate the people on how to get things done better, faster, make their jobs easier for them. So as a professional manufacturer of chemicals, which as you may know or may not know, we do produce all of our own chemicals in Houston, we make strong chemicals. Dealerships in this industry need strong chemicals. They need to mix a lot of water into them to save costs, but they also need something that works incredibly well. So that's what we do at Stinger and that's what brings more value to our line than anyone else's out there. I really like seeing people who are learning things and realize that their job can be easier than it is right now. Um, this industry has changed so much with all the different interior fabrics, different types of fabrics, different paints, that without having some kind of education, everyone's just kind of doing the same old thing. And to come in and do some education, show people that their job can be easier, that they can get results faster, and still have that same level of quality of what the cars need to look like, that's a lot of fun. So I think the biggest thing that I like to relay when I'm doing these is that it's, it's about process and procedure. Without a process in place and a procedure in place, it's never going to be fast and easy and come to the level of quality that the dealerships expect. So when I come into these classes, what I hope everyone takes away from it is that once they put in a process and a procedure and they have that in place, that things are gonna go smoother, faster, and the results are gonna continually be high where they need to be. We've been doing this since 1988, so we've been building chemicals. Started in Austin, Texas, and moved to Houston in 92, 91 or 92. Um, we service some of the largest national chains out there, Odessa Auto Auction, um, Carvana, places like that. So these people come to us with problems, and they say, how do we solve this problem? So we either come up with a, a guide, a process, procedure, or we come up with a chemical. So everybody wants to make more money, right? So the goals today are to help your job get easier, help you get results faster, good results, and in the end of all that, make more money. So think of me today as a walking, talking bank for your checkbook, we'll call it that. So we've got one day all the way up to 20 plus years over there. But in this room, we have cumulative about 100 years of experience in this business. So why are we sitting in a classroom? We got 100 years in this. There's no reason for us to all be sitting here, right? Well. I'll tell you why this class is important because, and this is actually a class that I'm building for another type of class as well, but if you look at this table, you see all these different tools. And all these tools are out in the market to make your jobs faster and easier. I was talking with Kelly earlier and we were talking about how when I started doing this probably 15 years ago, cars either had leather or cotton. That was it. So you either cleaned it with a all-purpose cleaner or a leather cleaner. That was as simple as it was. Cars are not like that anymore. Cars are much more complicated now. In fact, every manufacturer, I think, sits there at night and figures out ways to make the cars harder to clean. I honestly believe that. Because they are. They're harder to clean today than they've ever, ever been. So throughout the day, I'm gonna talk about tools. And I don't mean just tools like this. I mean things like this, and like this, and like that. All these things are here to make the job easier and get the job done better. We look at, I specifically had that one washed for a reason, because we're gonna talk about how that's a problem child. So when I talk about problem childs, I talk about 
interior problems, exterior problems, things that you guys run into. So throughout the class, I do want you guys to ask questions. In fact, if you don't ask questions, I throw things eventually. Like a little kid, I throw a fit. So ask the questions because one of the things I always tell people in these classes is that if you're thinking it, there's other people in the class thinking it too. You're not the only one that has that question, I guarantee. So if you have the opportunity, raise your hand, ask a question, tell me about something you ran into that's a problem. Because really that's what we're here for is problem solve. Let's talk about a mechanic. So over there, you got a bunch of mechanics and they all have this big, huge thing in front of them called their toolbox, right? Well, a mechanic can't get his job done without his tools. Just like us, we can't get our job done without our tools. That's what these are. Now a mechanic has three different wrenches that are all 15 millimeters, but they all have angles or differences to them. One's longer, one's shorter. Why does he have that? Because some cars he needs to use a short one on. Some cars he needs to use a long one. Some cars he needs to use the one that has the angle on it. Why? Because just like our cars that we're doing, engines are different. So every one of you sitting here is a technician. The thing that's important about what you guys do, all he does is make the car run the way it was when it came out of the factory. You guys are the ones at the front line sees because you're the ones that make the car pretty or not. And if the car's pretty, then it sells. Because the three things we want to accomplish, clean, smells good, and shiny. If we can accomplish those three things, we're gonna be successful. What you guys do here is really what sells that car out there. It ain't the mechanic that made it run exactly the way it did when it came out of the factory, because nobody gets excited about that. If your transmission works, your transmission works. Doesn't work any better when the mechanic gets done, it just works like it did when the factory had it. But what you guys do back here is what sells the cars out there. So when I call you guys technicians, I truly mean that you guys are technicians. Because if you do your job well, the cars sell. If you do your job well and quickly and get good results, you make more money. Let's talk about why all this stuff is sitting out here. So you guys all have this in front of you right here. This program has been around for a long, long time. Now I wrote this, but I didn't write it. This has been proven over and over and over again that six steps to detailing a car is the best way to do it. There's a routine, it's even numbered, one, two, three, four, five, six. So when we talk about a, a program like this, detailing by the numbers, we really talk about the process of how this, how this works. So let's look at prep bay. So when you bring a car in, what's the first thing you guys do? So when I ask you guys, when you bring that car in, what's the first thing you guys do? Can anybody get where I'm going with this? When sand is dry, when pet hair is dry, it comes out a lot easier. We have tools to get rid of pet hair, and that makes it great. But how do we make our jobs harder? By introducing water right away into the process. Because the minute that car gets wet, there's humidity, there's moisture that goes inside of it. All that sand turns into mud. All that pet hair turns into magnets. So one of the things I tell people is they say, well, wait a minute, I don't wash the car. I, I don't do this first step, I wash it first. And I say, okay, try this the next time. You get in a car that's really sandy, like this thing here, you get in a car that's really sandy like that, full of pet hair, and you go out to grab it, and you get inside and you see all that, do yourselves a favor, get all that stuff out first. So if you're looking at step number one, prep bay, I will tell you that every auction, every big production shop out there in the country, that's the very first thing they do with the car. Because they have figured out that they can probably save 10, 15, 20 minutes by doing that first. Well, 10, 15, 20 minutes, how many cars you guys run through in a day, 25 to 50? That starts to add up. What does that mean for you guys who are on flat rate? Get the car cleaner faster, make more money, right? So we're gonna look at what we call a process and a procedure. You may look at the process and procedure and go, I don't wanna do it that way. So you guys can choose to do what you want, but I will tell you that through all the years of doing this, and this program was really written by a guy named Rick Schmidt, who is the guy that I trained with or trained under. He did a lot of the training for another company out there. And when he wrote this, he wrote it for Nissan, Toyota, Mercedes, Odessa Auto Auction, Mannheim Auto Auction, 
and they gave him this money to write this program because they wanted to figure out how to get cars faster, cleaner, faster. So when I talk about how this works, this prep bay, this wash bay, interior, there's always gonna be a reason why I'm recommending them in the order that we're talking about. So the very first one, the prep bay, if we get all that stuff out of there when it's dry, it's a lot easier to get out. Dirt is easier to clean out than mud. Pet hair turns into magnets once it gets wet. Let's talk about tools. You guys have one of these somewhere? You guys have one of these yet? These are two very different tools that are designed to do the exact same thing. Remove pet hair. So without these tools, our job gets a lot harder. If you ever watch a mechanic, if he's doing a brake job on the back of the car, he doesn't keep running to the front to grab his wrenches, right? He puts them all in a cart like this, and he knows what he needs, and he brings them to the back of the car. Why does he do that? Because the mechanic gets paid just like you guys do. The more cars he gets done, the more money he makes. So mechanics have figured out a long time ago that one, I need tools, and tools make my job easier. Two, if I keep my tools organized, and I know where they're at, I get more cars done faster, because I know where my stuff is. I'm not chasing it all over the shop. But the prep bay is an area where if you don't do things right there, that means it takes longer to clean the interior. So the, the number one thing I will tell you about the prep bay is this. Doing things then will save you on step number three when you go to clean the interior. What do I say about that? We've talked about pet hair. We've talked about tools. We've talked about mud. Let's talk about pre-spotting. So interior cleaning right now is probably the thing I get the most questions on because every car is different. Every car has different materials on the inside. So let's talk about how cars are built. I told you that manufacturers sit up at night trying to figure out ways to make cars harder to clean. I'm 100% sure they do that because in the process of this, 25 years in this business, you used to take a Ford truck and you could pressure wash the inside of it out, leave the doors open, four hours later, it was dry, smelled good, no problem. If we take any of these cars nowadays, pressure wash the inside of them out, we've now wrecked every navigation screen, the car dries really poorly, smells like a wet dog, so we have figured out, okay, we gotta clean cars a different way. So what I have told people for years and years and years is we need to clean cars dry. We're gonna use extractors in some cases. We're gonna use a bucket in some cases. But what we need to do is we need to start the process of cleaning the car before we even get to that interior section. So you guys have glass cleaner, all clean, wow, enzyme, black scorpion. Any of these will clean, but they all work a little differently from each other. So let's talk about, I just told you we make all of our own chemicals. So in Houston, we may have a production facility and then we have another big warehouse, and then we have another office facility. The production facility is where we make everything though. So each of these chemicals is made to be different than the other ones. This is an alcohol base. This is a citrus base. This is an ammonia base. This is an enzyme. This is an alkaline. What does that matter to you guys? Nothing. You totally didn't need to know that, but what you do need to know is figure out which one does what. So this product here is great for cleaning microfibers. This is great for getting bugs off and degreasing wheels and engines and things like that. This one right here, so this was one of the very first products I sold with Stinger Chemical. And I would say probably every one of my customers after they figured out how to use this, used it. And what they did, and you look at it right here in the prep bay, once we get all that stuff out of the car, once we get the dirt, the hair, the trash and all that stuff out and we're ready to bring it into the wash bay, take this chemical right here and spray all the spots and stains with it. Because what an enzyme does differently than everything else is it has an actual living organism in it that eats protein-based products. Protein-based products are blood, urine, fecal matter, vomit, uh, oil. So what this does for you is it starts working before you even have to go in and clean the car. So when we talk about speed and productivity, if we have a chemical that does the cleaning for us ahead of time, that's something we want to use. So in that prep bay, you'll see that I have put certain chemicals in there that I recommend. That doesn't mean that's the only chemical that works for that, but it's the one that I found works the best to do the process. So enzyme, by its own nature, will start to clean. Those little bugs will start to eat things, and they'll get at all the stuff that we're trying to get out, and they'll start to eat it, and it will disappear. It's like magic. So we get done with that car, we get all the stuff out of it. Before we hit it with the wash bay, we take this, and we go spray it all over inside there. Normally, it's gonna take you 20 to 30 minutes to probably wash the car, dry it, and get all that stuff done. 
So this has 20 to 30 minutes to work before you even get it. This chemical, you can pre-spot with it, but it's really made for microfiber fabrics. This chemical is citrus, so it smells nice and it cleans well. This is great on the interiors. But all these right here are meant to be mixed with water. That water actually energizes the alkalines that are in these and makes it work better. So when Shane is selling you chemicals, a lot of times they need to be mixed with water. Sometimes I go in shops and I see my chemical 100% straight, and I say, how does that work? And they're like, oh, it's great. And I ask the manager, how's that black scorpion work? And they go, well, it wrecked the inside of a car. And I go, well, okay, that's because it wasn't mixed right. Chemicals like this, when they come in those big barrels over there, they're strong, too strong sometimes. So we definitely want to know what the dilution ratios are now. Shane has set up that nice little button pressing system over there, so you guys don't really have to worry about that. But the reason I talk about this is if something wrecks something inside a car, it's generally not the chemical, it's probably how the chemical was not mixed correctly. Chemicals like this, concentrates, make sure you're mixing them with water for two reasons. One, we don't want to wreck anything. Two, if we don't mix them with water, they're not actually going to work how we designed them to work. I'll tell you something about the wash bay. Single most important part of this whole entire process is the wash bay. Why is that? Because generally what takes you the longest to get done on the car? Buffing, right? Buffing is the thing that most people spend the most time on with the car. If we don't properly wash the car, and I watched what you guys did, and you did a nice job, by the way, whoever did that. So when we wash a car, why is it so important? Because all we're trying to do is knock the dirt off, right? Well, if we think about that, we're gonna buff that car later. So when we get that car to the point where we're gonna buff it, if it's not really clean, this thing over here turns into a grinding disc, turns into sandpaper, because we've added dirt to this. Well, this is designed to work a certain way, and it's designed to work without sand in it, because sand creates swirls, scratches, haze, all those things. So the wash bay is important, because when we get to that point, we have to get all that contamination off there. So let's talk about what we get off in the wash bay. We're cleaning wheels, we're cleaning paint, we're cleaning engines, we're cleaning wheel wells, running boards, windows, all those things. And so what's our soap? That's our lubrication, right? Lubrication, why is lubrication so important? Because if we don't have something that lubricates that surface, we're scratching it. So we use a foam cannon over there I saw, use a bucket sometimes. Okay. So. This provides a lot of lubrication. Half of the job of car wash soap is to lubricate the surface so we don't scratch it. When you guys go through car washes, I don't know about that one over there because I didn't look at it, but how many times you go through a car wash and you see hardly any suds and these brushes are beating the sides of your car? Well, we make car washes and car wash chemicals as well. One of the things that we really stress in our car washes is we want a lot of lubrication. That's why you get that big fancy show with all the foam. That's what stops a car from scratching. So first process in this, we wanna make sure we have some lubrication on there. Second process we wanna do is all those little cracks, crevices, mirrors, doors, little foam pieces, rubber pieces, they're great at holding dirt. So when they hold that dirt and we take this and we're buffing the car and we run across that little rubber strip that wasn't really, all that dirt didn't come out of, again, we're turning this into a sanding disc, not a buffing disc. So when we wash that car, we want to get the pressure washer out, and this is why you did a good job. You want to get that pressure washer into all those little cracks, crevices, crannies, nooks, all that stuff. If you're ever buffing a car and you look at it and go, oh, that's dirt. Well, now you're buffing the car for longer. You're not making as much money, and the buffing results are not going to be great. Buffing cars is not easy. Buffing cars is an art form in a lot of cases. Tools like that make it a lot easier, but still takes time to figure out how to do that. So if we do that car right in the wash bay, we're gonna make the buffing process easier down the line as well. So let's talk about wheels. Kelly and I were talking about this earlier. So you guys use a wheel acid to clean wheels, but do you ever get cars in that don't have OE wheels, big lifted trucks, stuff like that? So every chemical I make is safe, used on the right surface. If you guys have that vehicle, that vehicle, that vehicle, and that vehicle in here, and that vehicle over there, all those can be used with wheel acid, you're gonna have no problem. So let's think about this. Acid by nature is a nasty chemical. 
but we need a nasty chemical to clean wheels. So when you take this nasty chemical to clean wheels, there's a process. One, anytime a car comes in from outside, we want to make sure it's cool. Cool to the touch. Windows, paint, wheels, everything. When a car gets hot or a surface gets hot, what happens is it's just like your skin. They have pores. So that clear coat on that car has a porous surface, meaning that those pores open up and they'll suck chemical in, and that's where we get chemical staining from. Same thing with wheels. So when we're using wheel cleaner, we want to make sure the surfaces are cool. We want to spray, spray from the bottom to the top. Why do we want to spray from the bottom to the top? If we don't spray from the top down, we'll never ever have runs because it's never running across a dry surface. Gravity is going to pull the chemical down, but if we start at the bottom, go to the top, if those two things happen right there, you'll probably never ever wreck any wheel that you're working on, except for the custom wheels, the lifted trucks and the cool Nissan Zs or whatever that have those custom wheels on it. Those ones, they can wreck with acid. So this is great for OE wheels, meaning everything that's in here right now. When you get custom wheels in, I tell people use glass cleaner because most of the time those wheels aren't gonna be that dirty. Because what wheel acid does is it actually removes clear coat. Clear coat is the very top coating that's been on paint for about 20 years. About 12, 13 years ago, they decided, hey, we're gonna put clear coat on wheels too. Well, clear coat on wheels, when you're going down the road, hitting your brakes, the sun's out, and it's 105 degrees, those wheels get to be about 320 degrees. At 320 degrees, that clear coat gets real soft. It's like a magnet. That's why we talk about brake dust. That brake dust actually embeds itself into that clear coat. That's why we can't just take one of these and wipe it away. If we could spend all day, it's never gonna do that. So what we need to do is we need to remove that surface of that clear coat. And that surface of that clear coat has to be removed with a product like this, an acid. Now, there's a new one out it's called iron remover. So iron remover is a form of acid. It's just a different family of acids. So it's a safer acid. So this iron remover does the same thing as this. It actually attacks the little metal particles and pulls those little metal particles and turns them purple and eats them. So this also works to clean wheels. It just does it in a much safer way than this. So if you ever have a situation where management says no more wheel acids or somebody looks at the floor and says why is the floor getting wrecked that's wheel acids this is a great alternative so in that wash bay we're doing wheels paint windows you guys use the black scorpion to remove bugs all right so living in minnesota i understand about bugs when i went to texas and talked to people there which is where our company is based out of they go oh man do we have bug problems i'm like yeah, you guys don't have anything compared to what we deal with. What we have here is a lot, a lot of bugs. So tools like this, this surface is great for removing bugs. So we get all the bugs off, we get the wheels clean. Then what are we gonna do? We're gonna dry it, right? So what happens when we dry it most of the time? That's when all the scratches get in there. So brand new cars, people go, man, they're scratched right out of the factory. And I say, that's true. They are scratched out of the factory, but most of the time it's in that wash bay where we're putting more scratches into it, which causes more work down the line. So what do we want to do? We want to use foam cannons, a whole bunch of lubricity. We want to use nice wash mitts. We want to replace our brushes. Those brushes are 30 bucks for that brush head. And I walk in shops all the time and they're flat and they look like somebody ran them over with a car. And I say for 30 bucks, you replace that wash brush head and you won't have so much buffing to do. And they go, oh yeah. So now we got super cool wash mitts too. Microfiber wash mitts. Those are great too because they don't cause the scratches. So this towel, I'm gonna pass it around, it's wet, but. Towels like that are much softer than chamois or cotton terry towels. They're designed to dry, so they soak up a lot of water. Most importantly behind why we use things like that is we don't want to create more scratches. So when we get to the buffing section, which we're going to do later, we don't have to take out our own scratches that we put in. That Cadillac over there, if you guys have ever buffed on them, and they're getting a little better now, but about two years ago, I started seeing something. I'd walk in a shop and there'd be one of those sitting over in the corner, and I'd say, what's with the Cadillac over in the corner? They go, oh, no one can figure out how to buff it. It scratches up right away. Paint was super, super soft. 20 years ago, 
actually more than that now, we used a single stage paint. Single stage paint was very hard. We could take a wool pad on a metal grinder and we could buff that car. Now, that car over there has three layers of paint. Base coat used to be one color, one spray. That was what it was. Now we have a three-part system. That three-part system consists of a, a prep for the surface of the metal, the color, and then the clear coat on top of that. The clear coat on top of that is what we're buffing. So if you're ever buffing a black car and all of a sudden your buffing pad turns black, that would be a good indication to stop because we are not buffing color, we are buffing clear coats. Every car out there now has clear coats. Some of them have water-based clears, which are even softer. So in this section right here, one of the really, really important parts of it is we don't want to scratch the car because we got to buff it in step number four. So are you, are you claying the cars over there as you're washing them or after you wash them or are you bringing it into the bay and then claying them before you buff them? Claying them over there? Okay, are you using showroom shine? So important part of this one, we built this for clay. And when we say a clay mitt, you know, we're talking about this thing right here. So what happens just like the wheels is all that stuff gets embedded in the clear coat on the paint. And when it gets embedded on the clear coat in the paint, it sticks just like those wheels. So this tool is what takes off all those little rough particles, metal and all that stuff that's stuck in there. They stick to this kind of like a magnet. Problem with this is if we don't have any of this lubrication or that really heavy foam, from the car wash soap, this will scratch the car too. So that's why I tell people all the time, this is what was designed to be used with this. Now this also will wipe away dust and fingerprints and things like that. But truly this product, we made it more than anything else to work with these right here or to work with clay. Doing this in the wash bay is 100% fine as long as you have that lubricity. I go in shop sometimes, I see it in the bay and someone's doing this and I hear it from all the way across the shop and I'm like, hmm. That's, here, let me show you something. <laughs> so claying the car over there removes that contamination. That contamination, again, aids or adds to that problem of creating scratches. So if we don't do this, but we're gonna buff a car later on, it's not going to work very well because all that stuff that's on that surface, all that rough feeling stuff is gonna go into this right here. So before we buff today, we're gonna do a decontamination process. So the reason I mentioned this chemical for wheels, and I said there's another purpose, is all that stuff that we're claying off of there, a lot of it's brake dust, a lot of it's metal particles or metal contamination. This actually probably was made more so for that purpose. The majority of its use now is to get all those little metal, metal particles out. That's why it turns that purple if you've ever seen it. Some of you may have seen this, I'm sure you have. Okay, so what this does, is it seeks out all those little metal, metal particles and takes them out. It eats them. So it takes that metal, eats it, makes it go away. The reason that's so important in ceramic coatings is if we don't get that off that surface and out of that paint, it discolors later on. That's those little orange spots that you see in white cars a lot of times. That's where we're removing with the clay mitt or we're removing them with the clay. If we don't remove those and we put a coating on the top of it, whether it be a wax, ceramic coating, whatever, if those particles are still there, they're still gonna continue to turn red. Now, ceramic coatings by nature are about 10 times harder than clear coat. So you can imagine what happens if you don't remove those and then you throw a ceramic coating over the top of it, they are now in there for probably five to seven years. So one of the calls I get a lot when I'm out in the field is, hey, I used your ceramic coating and now my car's got all these orange spots. And I say, oh, okay, well, when you clayed it, were there orange spots to begin with and they go clay? Well, that's why we have chemicals like this. And also the other side behind this is you can get into areas that you can't get into with clay or clay mitt because all those areas, all those door seams and all that stuff and that little pinch rail underneath, that will get into there and do exactly the same thing as what you're trying to accomplish with this. Because what happens with paints, especially right now, this is kind of an industry thing, these cars are getting pushed out of those factories so fast, they're not having the time like they used to to sit there and have that paint gas out and kind of do its thing. So they slap that plastic on them right away and then you guys get the problems when they come here. So that fogginess that you're getting, that you're using the heat gun, that works very well, but it also sounds like they're scratched right out of the factory as well. So we got to buff brand new cars. That used to not be a thing, but it is now, unfortunately. So yes, you have scratches in transport. You also have what's called transfer marks. Transfer marks are those little things you can kind of wipe off with your finger, or you can use a solvent and they wipe right away. 
Those are things that we're gonna deal with when the car's brand new. They're gonna come from the factory that way anyways. Nothing we can do about that. But what we can do is we can make sure we don't add to that problem because then that takes time later on. Our goal is to get lots of cars out of here. This is what I call a production shop, meaning that you're gonna get 25 to 50 cars out of here in a day. A ceramic shop, they will tell you how they do things. Well, they're getting $1,000 to do that. They can do it any way they want. In here, we have to have a process, a system, we have the tools, we have to do it the same way every time, just like when you guys get up in the morning and do your thing. It has to happen that same way every single time. If it doesn't, it's gonna take longer, you're gonna have more problems. And then when we go to Buff, that black Cadillac over there, we've gotta deal with all the problems that we created ourselves. So, that's why a process like this is so important. When we talk about interior clean, we're gonna talk about a thing called physical agitation. Physical agitation means we actually have to put a hand, a brush, a mitt, a tool of some sort on that surface. Acids are designed by nature to not have that physical agitation necessary to clean because they actually eliminate the problem by eating it. So, also the same as this one right here. This is the only other chemical I sell that will work without any physical agitation. Enzyme, when we build enzymes, we actually put food inside of them, because remember, they're living organisms, so they actually need food to stay alive. So when we bottle it, we put enough food in there to have it last a certain length of time. In our enzyme, in a five gallon container, it's probably enough food in there for a year, but once you open it up and mix it with water, that does shorten the life of it. So usually enzyme in a spray bottle like this will be about seven days, um, usually, if, if you're not using this bottle in seven days, you need to really start using it a lot more because it is a pretty miraculous chemical. This far and away, when anyone says to me, I have a problem inside a car, first thing I say is, did you try enzyme? Exterior of the vehicle, it's important to take your time. There is something that's called point of impact. That's a really fancy word for basically get that pressure washer right where it needs to be to flood out all those channels. If you do all those things right, then you get to step four and there's a lot less work to do there. Um, your question on tar, though, is a good one because there are, you know, obviously the old saying is there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. There is a lot of ways to clean cars. There's just ones that I found work better and are faster. But tar does add something into the mix depending upon how you want to do it. So generally what I find is in the wash bay, it's really hard to see the tar. Usually when you pull it into your bay and you're about to buff it, that's when you're going to see the tar. Okay, so you guys use specialty adhesive remover. That's your tar remover right there. Yeah, so what solvents do, so solvents are a whole different family than all these other things. So solvents are basically for adhesives, tar, gum, anything like that. That's where your solvents come in. I don't do it in the wash bay though, and I don't train that way because what inevitably happens in the wash bay is someone's behind you waiting to get the car in, so we're trying to hurry. So we miss the tar, we get it over to buffet, and that's when we find the tar because it's now on top of our pad. So I like to make sure that it's dry, that it's in a really lit up well area that I can see really well, and then I'll remove the tar just piece by piece. Now, if you get a vehicle in that's full of tar, you can certainly spray it all down before you wash it and have that start working because tar's not fun to get off. So yeah, you can certainly spray it in the wash bay before you wash it. It's just really hard to see the tar until it really gets clean and dry. If a surface is hot, it changes everything. That's why whenever we bring a car in, I tell people, hit it with water right away, cool it down, make sure it's cool to the touch. If you guys have ever went out and grabbed a black car off the lot in the middle of summer, and you put your hand on it, it's hot enough to fry an egg. If we spray a chemical on that hot surface, any chemical, even water, it will do possibly damage to that. So specialty needs to remove we build it so it's safe for any surface as long as that surface is cool. We're gonna to get to the interior now, which I think is the part that probably will help you guys the most or we'll spend quite a bit of time on. Then we're gonna buff. So interiors, here's where I get most every question. So I do these classes in Houston once a month and the number one questions I get are on interiors nowadays. Paint, I get a lot of questions as well. That's usually more on the advanced side of things, but we're gonna do some cool things that Kelly and I were talking about earlier with paint. But interior, like I said, it used to be that you had leather or cotton. Now we've got microfiber, leather, pleather, uh, velour. My daughter has PVC seats in her Subaru. 
Never even knew they existed until she bought her Subaru and I'm looking at them one day, I'm like, that's a weird seat. Well, she has like this XT version that you can basically have a dog in for 10 days and it doesn't wreck the seats because they're basically rubber, kind of. So now we have another surface that we have to learn how to clean. So with interiors, the most important thing about cleaning interiors is tools and chemicals. We've talked about this one, the enzyme. Remember we used that earlier on because we want it to do its job. Let's talk about these three right here. So black scorpion you guys are generally gonna use as your degreaser. But if you have a vehicle that's got a lot of really bad grease oil buildup in the carpets, construction truck, something like that, this works fine on carpets and it will attack grease differently than these will. This is a heavier, stronger chemical probably than these you could say, but it's different too. It's more of a degreaser, attacker of oils, solvents, things like that. This one is an ammonia base. Now this one may cause you issues because it's kind of strong, um, but we built this when microfiber fabrics came out. We built this specifically for microfiber fabrics. Remember we talked about keeping things dry, that way they don't smell like a wet dog. This chemical has a real, flash, real fast flash to it, meaning it dries real quickly. So what happens with microfiber seats, if you've ever cleaned them and got them clean and then came back four hours later, all the spots and stains and rings are back. What happens with that is when you're cleaning a microfiber seat and you get it too wet, you take all that dirt, push it down into the seat, into where the foam is, and the dirt looks like it goes away. And then when it dries, microfiber has no ability to lock that dirt down there. So it all creeps back up to the top. And that's how we get seats that are restaining, even though it looks like we got them clean. The idea behind cleaning microfiber seats successfully is to keep them dry. So this product was designed specially for microfiber seats. So if you're not using it, it will definitely help you. The way it's used most of the time is you're gonna spray the whole seat down with it. And then you're gonna take a towel or an extractor and go through and extract it back out. If you use it evenly across the whole seat, you will not have those stains popping back up. Ammonia also has the ability to kill odors. Let's think about microfiber versus cotton. So a cotton terry towel has hundreds of fibers per square inch. A microfiber has thousands of fibers per square inch. So the weave on microfiber is much finer. If we look at this towel here, this has a pretty rough weave to it. There's not a lot of fabric. This one has a whole bunch of fabric. So what happens with microfibers is they lock in dirt a lot better than a cotton terry towel like this. If we're cleaning a microfiber seat, the only way to truly get it clean, clean is to use a microfiber towel. How do we use a microfiber towel effectively on a seat? You can do this. Take a brush, wrap your microfiber around it, attack your stains like this. The problem with our hand is symmetrically our hand is not perfect. So if we use this to clean a seat and we sprayed wow all over it and then we go wipe it like this, you're gonna pull that dirt off and you're gonna see it on the microfiber and you just keep finding a new cleaner spot on the microfiber. Microfiber meshes with microfiber. If you think about Velcro, so there's two different types of Velcro. You have the fabric stuff, and then you have the plastic stuff. If you try and take the fabric and stick it to the plastic, they don't mesh, they don't stick together. But if you take the same plastic one and the plastic one on this side, they mesh together and they stick and they're really strong. That's the same thing with microfiber. They interlock differently with that microfiber seat because of that real fine fabric, and they clean better. So. Some shops, when I go into, they're still using terry cotton towels. They have horrible problems getting seats clean because they just don't work. So suede by nature is supposed to be a leather. In cars nowadays, we don't actually use much leather. It's actually most of the time pleather, plastic, or some situation like that. Um, those, suede is what I call velour. They have that real low nap to them and they're almost like a leather. Those are not hard to clean, but they're easy to mess up. So in those situations, I would only use a nice microfiber towel. I wouldn't use brushes because brushes are gonna rip up that fabric real fast. So I have a couple guys in my office that I challenge every now and then to clean a bad part of a car, one of the employee's cars or something like that. So that particular type of fabric, when they got it in, they tried pretty aggressively to clean it with a brush um, on a drill. So that works great on carpets. Doesn't work so great on these new types of seats. So. Every seat, a little different. There's no right or wrong way to do it as long as the results come out good, because you don't run across those until you figure out 
you know, okay, now I've got this seat, how do I get it clean? You try all these different things, that's how you get it. But WOW is perfect for microfibers. Enzyme is also great for spotting microfibers because, again, we want to keep them dry. So let's talk about um, tools in the interior. So we talked about tools for the exterior, wheel brushes, things like that. You guys have all used the Tornador, the Tornado tool, because when that came along, it revolutionized our cleaning industry. There's some important functions with the Tornador. Our chemical that you guys use is called Twister. It's designed to dry real quickly. So again, if, I, if you keep hearing me talk about cleaning the car dry, keeping it dry, the reason we want to do that is because one, the stains will pop back up if we get it too wet. Two, cars don't dry like they used to. You can put it outside, let it run, open all the doors, shut it up, put it on the lot. Two weeks later, you open it up, it smells like a wet dog. Once that wet dog smells in there, it's very, very difficult to get that out. So this is another tool that cleans dry. This tool especially, the chemicals we make for it, they're safe. There's only three that I recommend. This one, diluted at one to 30, meaning that you have a tiny little bit in the bottom and the rest water. Not ideal and not what I think works best. Twister, which you guys have over there that you guys run into this, perfect chemical for it. Or this one right here, because this chemical's safe. You can breathe this all day long, not a problem. Put in here, works great on your microfiber seats, your carpets, anything like that. You guys have these around? Yep. All right. This tool, when it came along, I thought it was the dumbest thing in the whole entire world. And then I realized, no, it actually works really well. So generally what we're cleaning with this is vinyl and leather. I'll tell you about leather. Leather is not leather. It's not, cows aren't pink, cows aren't perfectly black, cows aren't perfectly brown, they're spotted, they're not pink. So what happens with leather, if it is leather or pleather, they coat it with a spray. So when you see it done in a factory, they have it hanging, they coat it with a spray, and that becomes the color that the leather is. So if we use a brush like, I said, if we use a brush like this on leather, it's very possible we're gonna wreck it. If we use this very gentle brush, works great. So leather, if you've ever seen the leather, that one has it right there, the ventilated seats. Well, when ventilated seats first came out, nobody would clean them, because they're like, well, I'm just gonna wreck the seat. This is your answer to that. You can get in the little spots and holes with this. Technically, this is a parts cleaning brush, but it works great for cleaning leather. This brush works great for cleaning leather. I don't recommend taking heavy, harsh brushes like this one and cleaning leather, because you're gonna wreck it. And once leather wrecks, once it's compromised, it never gets better. If you see a leather seat that looks really, really dirty, find a magnifying glass, look at that leather seat through the magnifying glass, you will see that it's not dirt, the leather's actually cracked. And once leather cracks, what do we see underneath that? The actual color of the leather. So when you see a really dirty leather seat and you think, oh man, I gotta clean that, and you grab this aggressive brush and start going at that leather that's already cracked and compromised, you're just gonna make it worse. Gentle is always the key to cleaning leather. Ventilated seats like that, they're fine to clean, you're not gonna wreck them. Just do it gently and do it with a brush. That's not gonna wreck the surface. Um, leather seats, I'd rather clean leather seats all day long than fabric nowadays. Nice gentle chemical, nice gentle brush, nice gentle towel, you'll never wreck leather. Okay, so this product is designed to be mixed with water. In its straight raw form, it's very, very strong. You can do this and you'll have a headache. So what he has marked on this bottle is seven to one. Do you guys understand the dilution ratio, seven to one, one to one, that kind of thing? Some of you guys probably do. So what that means, when you have seven to one, that means that you've got one part chemical, seven parts water. So your chemical is always going to be the least amount in that. So when you have a 10 to one dilution ratio in a bottle like this, that means there's three ounces of product and the rest of it's water. So seven to one, this is about five ounces of product, the rest water. This is perfectly strong the way it is right now to clean and do a great job. One of the things in our industry that happens a lot is if it works good now, it'll work better if it's stronger. That's not always the case. And what that results in, in some cases, is damaging or destroying things. So, like I said, when I have people calling me and saying, hey, your chemical wrecked this, and I'm like, but you've been using it for eight years. How come it just wrecked this one car? Two things happen. Either the car has changed, and that surface can't be cleaned with that chemical, or the new guy came in and didn't mix it the right way and used it too strong. So, so don't wreck cars, that's a bad thing. We wanna stay away from that. So, do you guys use extractors? 
Okay. So with extractors, are you guys using a solution in them or just water? Using a soap in the extractor is good. Use very little or as little as you need to because generally extractors are pretty good with the hot water as is. If you're using this, you don't need to extract as much. In some cases with this, you can get by with just tornado and the enzyme. Pre-treat it, hit it with the tornado, and you're done. Headliners. Um, when you think about headliners, headliners are held up by glue. Well, those glues are water-soluble glues, meaning that the more wet they get, the, less, the more likely they are to fall down. So cleaning headliners has to be pretty gentle. So what I tell people, don't ever grab this or this or this, because it will ruin the headliner, and don't want to get it really, really wet. So what you want to do with headliners, you can use the tornado, you can use the enzyme or wow, spray it on the towel, and just wipe the headliner with the towel. If you want to use glass cleaner, that's okay too. Whatever you want to use, just make sure it's something that dries quickly and isn't colored. Because if it's pink, like this, well, it might make the headliner pink. Headliners are a whole different material than every other part of the car. They're real, they soak in chemicals real quickly, and they're held by a glue that will fall down and make that headliner sag, and that's never a good thing. That's a very good question. So the question was, does hard water or soft water make a difference? Very much so. Car washes put in $5,000, $6,000, $10,000 in filtration, reverse osmosis, water softening systems because they can make their chemicals go a lot further with softer, higher quality water. So yes, when you're taking a black scorpion and mixing it in a city with city water that's treated, you can usually mix it out further than if you're out in the country running off well water, whatever the case is. In the detail section, you will see that every chemical has a dilution ratio up to. So one of the things that people say is, oh, I can mix this at 30 to one. You can, you can put one ounce in here and you can fill the rest with water, but it's probably not gonna be strong enough to really do a lot of heavy cleaning. That's why we say up to one to 30. Now, if it's a car wash and they're handing you the towel through the window and you're just wiping your dash down with it, sure, you can use very little of that and a lot of car washes do. For our purposes, Generally, this chemical is going to be 10 to 1. So that chemical goes a long, long way. But up to is what we always do in our catalog. So if you're looking at a chemical and you're looking at something you've got over there and you see up to 1 to 30, but he's got it mixed at 1 to 7 through the machine, that's because it needs to be a little stronger for a certain type of situation that you guys are in. Um, the other thing about smells is the car's got to be clean, really clean, before you use any kind of odor products on it because those odor products are designed to kill odors, but think about dirt, you know, when you have a, a, an area that's got a lot of dirt in it, you can smell the dirt. So if you don't get all the stuff out first, that's a problem, but then the smell eradicators come in after that. The gas, or the uh, machine that he's talking about, that's the fogger, those are great because they get it everywhere. You know, they can get into every nook, cranny, everything else. Enzyme, though, enzyme by nature, because it eats dirt, it will also kill odors. Ammonia, is what's in a lot of odor killing chemicals we use around our house. So if you're not using like a wow or an enzyme on the steering wheel, if you're just using a standard degreaser all purpose cleaner that really doesn't have any odor killing properties, that's another area that will smell as well. So if you think about steering wheels, smoke, uh, fast food oil, when he's eating his McDonald's french fries and he's steering while he's going down the road, he gets his McDonald's french fries oil all over his steering wheel. That's all gonna smell as well, and those are the two things that are closest to our faces when we're driving the car. So steering wheels, that's another area where you wanna use a wow on them if you've got a smoke car. Smoke cars, basically, the more chemicals you can use, the better off you are. I mean, even if you can get it smell like chemical, not smoke, that's probably better than smoke. So there's an old saying, and, and we'll talk about it when we talk about buffing. There's the sledgehammer, and there's the claw hammer. So if you're pounding a nail in your wall at home, which hammer do you grab? Claw hammer, right? Yeah. We don't grab the sledgehammer because we know the sledgehammer is going to put a hole in the wall. The claw hammer will get the nail into the wall just fine. It's kind of the same rule with cars as well. Don't go right to the sledgehammer. Start off with the claw hammer and see if we can't get it clean with a lighter duty chemical. But when we have to, this is our sledgehammer right here. And that's farm trucks, construction trucks, anything like that. And usually those types of vehicles, you're not going to get them perfectly clean anyways. It's not like that over there or you know, the $100,000, $130,000 brand new vehicles like that. 
they're construction trucks, they're gonna go to somebody who's probably gonna use it as a construction truck again. So the sledgehammer is okay in that situation. So foaming is a whole different effect with a chemical because foam attacks the surface and lifts the dirt up. So anytime we use an aerosol that foams, it works really well because it attacks that surface, grabs the dirt and then lifts it up and then we can pull that dirt off that surface. Foam is dry. Generally, when we foam a car with some type of chemical, it stays drier much faster because that foam doesn't have the ability to sink down into the padding inside the seat. So using a tool to create foam is a great way to clean a car. Stains are one of those things where you just got to keep trying stuff. And when I train people in Houston, one of the things I tell them is the reason we make different chemicals is sometimes the chemical works better, not only on a certain type of fabric, but it might be a certain type of dirt too. So now we're gonna talk about the fun stuff. We're gonna talk about paint, and then we'll do some buffing. This car is not the same car as what it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we could take a big, heavy white wool pad, and we could take a rotary buffer, which is a grinder. A lot of people don't know that, but rotary buffers, the one that spin around in a circle, are grinders. That's what they use to grind metal. So that's what we did back then. Nowadays, these cars are very soft, there's a lot of prep that goes into them and a lot of things have to be done right before we actually buff. So what I'm gonna talk about first, we're gonna talk about buffers. So you guys are using all Rupus buffers at this point? Okay, so multitude of different brands out on the market, but the thing about a Rupus buffer or any new style buffer is that orbital action like that. But the key to this style of buffer is the action of that pad. It doesn't spin in a circle. It goes in an orbital pattern and it goes in a random orbital pattern gener generally too. The reason that's important is one, if we use a rotary buffer on this soft paint, we will get swirls. Now I do this all over the country and inevitably I have somebody that goes, I've been doing this 20 years, I can make sure, I don't, I don't swirl cars. It's not a process of skill, it's a process of the tool. There's no way you can't swirl a car with a rotary buffer because all it does is go in a circle. No matter if you move it this way, that way, this way, it goes in a circle. This, no matter what you do, is never gonna create that same pattern over and over again. So it's never gonna create that type of swirl. So when your body shop does cars, you ever see them come out of there and they've got the swirlies down the side or like the mirror effect? That's generally because body shops are using rotary buffers. That's just the body shop industry. The detail industry, you guys are using the right setup with this style buffer. What I want to talk about right now is how we're gonna to get to the point where we can buff this car. So you guys are doing a lot of claying, clay mitting. That's good because we can't take the surface of this paint. If this paint's scratchy, and I'm sure you guys have all felt that scratchy surface like that. Everybody has felt that. And then you do a clay or a clay mitt and you feel that surface is smooth. That's because we removed all the stuff in there, all that contamination. Well, if you think about it, if we don't remove that contamination and we take this pad and we put it on this surface, that contamination immediately attaches to this pad and we have sandpaper because that's what sandpaper is. It's little tiny grits, little dirt, whatever you want to call it. So we create micro sanding paper by doing that. Very first thing when we get this car washed, we clay it, we wipe it down, we make sure we have a smooth surface. Let's talk about different types of pads. Wool pads, usually a couple different styles, even with different manufacturers. Some are designed to finish, some are designed to cut. Foam pads, which generally are going to be designed to finish, but there are cutting pads in foam as well. I particularly like this pad and this pad. Why? Because they're right in the middle. They're not super soft like this one. So when you feel these pads, that one's real soft and squishy and real fine. This has got a little more of a pour to it, a little stiffer. That's how you determine if a pad's gonna cut or polish. So in any type of media, meaning microfiber, wool, foam, you're gonna have a range of pads that are gonna go from a cut to a finish. When we test spot on a car, we wanna start in the middle. That yellow pad is a nice one to start with because it's got a little cut and it's got quite a bit of polish it's not gonna cut out real heavy scratches and things like that, but the key to buffing is test spotting. 
because we don't know what's gonna happen with this paint. This paint might be really hard, meaning that it's gonna be really hard to get the scratches out of it, or it might be really soft. The new black Denali's, the new Escalades, super, super soft paint. I mean, when those things came out, most every shop said, yeah, every time we touch it, it hazes. So we just stop buffing them. Well, they look like crap coming from the factory. So you gotta buff them. So what ended up happening was we realized super, super fine products were now a part of what we needed to have in our lineups. Super, super fine meaning you're gonna have a very mild cut, meaning it's not gonna cut out a lot of heavy defects, all the way up to a very coarse cut that will cut out heavy defects. That's decided by the product and also the pad because the pads, just like the compounds, are designed in some, one end of the spectrum to cut out really heavy scratches and the other end of the spectrum to polish to a really, really fine, high sheen luster. People always say, well, how do I know which pad to use with what product? Testing. So that's why a test spot's so important. So the very first thing, once I get a vehicle to the point like this, where it's clayed, it's smooth, it's decontaminated, and I start to look at what I'm gonna do to buff it, I'm generally gonna go right in the middle and start with my middle products and see what results I get. And all I'm gonna do is one little round spot right here because the last thing I wanna do is buff the whole entire thing only to wipe it all away and realize, ooh, that didn't work at all. We don't always wanna buff a car two, three times. Sometimes we wanna buff a car once. That's why we test spot, because if we can buff it once, who makes more money? Well, you guys, right? The less work you have to do, the more money you make. And most of the time cars nowadays are pretty easy to buff in one step unless you're looking for perfection. If you're looking for perfection, that's when you've got to go a two, three step buff. In a dealership production facility, generally the goal I always have when I come in is to teach you guys how to buff in one step. Because in one step, if you can get the car done and out the door, everybody's happy. The beauty of the technology of products, buffers, pads, is that the buffing has become a lot easier. If this was 20 years ago, you'd have to make a lot of mistakes, burn a lot of paint, wreck a lot of things before you figured out, okay, this is how I can do it, this is how I cannot do it. Now, you don't have to worry about that. It's almost impossible to burn and wreck paint nowadays. Let's talk about tools. Why do we have different size tools? When the goal is to get done quickly, why not just use this big pad and this big tool and get it done as quick as possible? That mentality, about five, six years ago, this was the only thing we had. But if we look at this car, we have an area right here that's three inches. This pad is six and a half inches. So we're using a six and a half inch pad in an area that really requires a three inch pad. Why would we use this right here? Because when our pad makes full contact, we don't make big messes. When we can buff this area real quickly with that smaller tool, it's actually faster to do that. If you don't have both these tools available to you, buffing does take longer. Because with this big tool, you're working really hard to get into areas where this pad does not fit correctly. The other thing about big areas like this buffer here is that action is real violent. So that action moving it back and forth, you get a thing called pad stall. When you have a big pad on and you're trying to do a little area, that pad stall still will cut and polish, but it's going to not do it as well as if you're using a tool that's fit for that size. The learning curve on them is very short. The technology is there. The products that they're using on them are there. But there's some things we want to think about. If we have a scratch, and there's none on this one that I could find, that we can catch with, oh, there's one on this one though. If I can catch that scratch with my fingernail, that scratch is not removable. We can make it look better, we can almost remove it, but remember, we have three layers to our paint. Underneath this clear coat is black, underneath the black is a, a prep or primer material. So when we catch our fingernail on a scratch, that means it is through two of these layers down to that white underneath it. That will never be removable. Now, you'll have people, old school guys, that have been doing this for 30 years, they'll tell you, oh, well, you just heat the paint up so much that you melt the paint back together. And I will tell you that I've worked with almost every paint manufacturer out there, and every single one of them has told me, don't heat paint up. It's gonna get a little hot because we're creating friction on that surface, but you don't wanna get it so hot that you can melt the paint. So our goal, clean, smells good, shiny. So most of the time our goal is shiny. 
And to get cars shiny, we don't have to remove every one of those scratches because this one right here is a prime example. I can see all these little micro scratches in it, but when I looked at it out there, couldn't see those micro scratches in it. Because the light in here and the light out there are two totally different things. Light in here will show little scratches. The light out there, the sunlight, will show haze and swirls. So if we're buffing a car in here and we see these little scratches and we keep thinking we have to buff and buff and buff, chances are when we pull it out there, you're never gonna see them. There's only so much paint on this car. There's only so much that we have to work with. So one of the things we don't wanna do is buff so much that we eliminate all that paint because then we go through to the color and that's bad. That looks way worse than scratches. So our job is to get as shiny, as many scratches out as possible in as short a time frame as possible. Test spot. Start in the middle. If it doesn't remove the scratches, then you go to your heavier pad, your heavier product, your heavier cutting product, your compound. If it hazes, then we move the opposite direction. We go down to the lesser cutting because we don't want haze because that takes away from shine. We don't want to cut a whole bunch because if we compound real heavily, we're gonna have to do a second or third step on it. And if we can avoid that, that's what we want. And some cars, the scratches come out of them really easy. Some they don't, and you never know. So there is no real predictability on what you're gonna get when you start buffing a car. That's why test spotting is so important. Once we have our surface ready, meaning no contamination, we've clayed it, clay emitted it, we've iron removed it, we wiped it down with a good solvent to make sure there's no tar or anything like that on there, then we're ready to buff. My name is Shane Shook. I'm one of the co-owners of s and I've been in this chemical industry for 35 years. What surprises me most about the industry are how things are changing with coatings, with waxes, with compounds, with paints and clear coats. It's a constant change and you're continuously adapting to the new surfaces, the new waterborne paints, um, things like that. Uh, we chose the Stinger chemical line because it is superior to most 99% of them out there. Uh, we, they make a great product. They make a very concentrated product, meaning in the long run, the customer gets more for their money, plain and simple. My favorite part of the demonstrations is just seeing the look on people's faces when you teach them something they did not know. It could be the smallest thing from centering a pad or using a, a microfiber towel in the correct way. You just know at the end of the seminar they, they're going to walk away with some knowledge that's going to help them be better at what they do and hopefully make them more money in the long run. So this car has been pre-washed before we brought it over to this station. But one of the products we're going to demo is 794 Iron Remover. First, you want to wash the car, rinse it off, and have the surface wet. So again, the car has been pre-washed. We're just going to wet the surface. We are going to take our iron remover, ready to use, mist it lightly on the surface, including fenders, down on the wheel, and then you wait three to five minutes and let the product do its job. It's a slow-release agent that's in it. So again, three to five minutes. You can see how it's starting to turn purple, so you know there's iron contaminants on the rim. Brake dust um, is 99% of the front wheels. Behind the wheels, you get brake dust that's burned into the clear coats on the surfaces. White vehicles, you can see it instantly. I can see a little purple right here with the lighting. Uh, like again, I say white, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Okay, it's been three minutes. You can clearly see three to five minutes the running of the purple. Uh, now all you have to do is basically rinse it off, wash it with soapy water, and you're good to go. So on the other half of the car, we use the 794 iron out remover on the surface and on the wheels to decontaminate the paint. On this side, we are gonna use a clay mitt and a clay bar, and showroom pink number 822 is the lubricant. Again, when using your bar, flatten your bar out flat, mist your showroom shine on as the lubricant, and get plenty on there because you want to lubricate the bar so you're not wet sanding your surface. Again, we're only going to use one side of the bar. Put your bar down and clay the contaminants off. You will hear it 
as you swipe the bar, you will feel and hear the items being pulled off the surface. A lot of times on light colored cars, you can actually take and see the darkness running down the paint when all the contaminants start coming free from the clay bar. So again, we're using the clay bar in this half. You can hear it. So I know there's still some more there because I can hear it as the bar swipes across it. And I can see it in the, on the paint running. I can see the darkness that it's taken off. On the second half, again, when you're using the clay bar, as it gets dirty, fold it to the middle and then flatten it out and only use one side of the clay bar. If you use both sides and you go to flatten it, you don't have a clean side to go to, and this clay bar will last one-tenth as long. If you drop it, as I said before, throw it away. You've now picked up every contaminant on the ground and you will scratch your car hood. So we have appropriate storage containers for these. Put it in the container, miss the little showroom shine, and then seal it up to keep it clean. Do not use soapy water as your lubricant for the clay bar. Do not use window cleaner. Do not use multi-purpose cleaners or bug remover. The showroom shine is a lubricant made for the clay bar so it will not mold it or ruin the clay bar. Other products that have different things in it will either dissolve your clay bar and turn it gooey or turn it rock hard or just destroy the clay bar completely and have mold inside of it. Again, these two products were made side by side. This half of the car, we are gonna clay it with a clay mitt. Put your hand in the mitt, spray your lubricant on, and spray your mitt, and take and swipe your mitt. You can hear the contaminants on the clear coat. It sounds like you're rubbing your hand across sand. Take your swipes. You'll feel it get smoother and slipperier as you get all the contaminants off the surface. Here you go. Wipe your surface down. And you can feel the difference from a side that is clayed and a side that is not clayed. You can put your back of your hand and feel it, or again, slip your hand in a bag while the lubricant is still in the hood and swipe your hand in a Ziploc bag. You will feel the surface. Before we start buffing, we are gonna use tree sap remover. It is a product used to remove all oils and contaminants left on the clear coat, whether it be finger oil, other compounds, polishes, things like that. Give it a slight mist. Take your microfiber and just wipe across. Again, I'm using edgeless microfiber towels, not edged, because I am working with the paint of the surface of the vehicle. No edges, no tags, no scratches from the towels. In this part, we are gonna show you, I call it seasoning the pad and figuring out the pad and the product that you need to do the job correctly. Um, take your, always take your Rupus products, put your finger over the hole and shake them just in case they're open. To season a wool pad from Rupus correctly, you are to take and put a little bit of an amount over the whole pad and I take the edge of the butter knife and I spread it on the pad evenly. The product does not disperse evenly on a wool pad as it does a foam, so by spreading it, then I know the surface is wet. We're gonna turn the buffer over on its face, turn it down to one, one and a half, turn it on and move it around for 30 to 45 seconds. This is called seasoning your pad. And the same time, we're gonna be spot buffing to see if the yellow product and the yellow wool pad is what, it, what is needed to do this hood. So when we are done, we're going to have a season pad and we'll also have a test spot done. I am a yellow and yellow guy. Some people like to use Uno Pier in a yellow or the blue in the blue. I just start in the middle. So turn your buffer on, run it for 30 to 45 seconds. And again, you noticed I am not pushing on the buffer. I'm letting the buffer, the product and the pad do the work for me, not my arms and back. At the end of the day, when you're using a Rupus buffer, your arms and back should not hurt. If they do, you're leaning in, you're struggling, you're fighting the buffer. So I'm gonna wipe off my test spot. And look at it. And it doesn't look bad, but this hood is pretty scratched up, so I can see we're gonna have to go with the blue and the blue. 
it got rid of some of the scratches, but not all of them. So with that said, I am going to use my brush, fluff the pad back up so the next time I grab it, the pad is ready to go, or an air hose, whatever you have on hand. This claw tool is also a removal tool for getting pads off. The, the Rupus Velcro and the backing plates are amazing. If you use this tool to get underneath and pull your pad up, you're not pulling on the pad to rip the foam and then your pads last, ha last half as long. This way here, you'll prolong the life of your pad and it makes it easier to get it off. So we're gonna grab a new wool, Rupus wool pad. Again, before I use any pad for the first time, I either take an air gun and I blow it out or I use this tool to get away, get away any loose fibers that are on the pad. Again, always make sure you close your containers so they're not sitting open and drying out. Yellow pad or yellow microfiber, yellow compound. Keep your pads and your product together. You don't want to cross contaminate compound with polishing pads or you'll get scratches. Take your bottle, put your finger over the hole, shake it. It is a water-based product. Again, we're seasoning a blue pad for the first time. So take your product, get all your fibers wet. I always take the back of the, the tool and just spread it around evenly. So now we are going to do a test spot just a further down from the other one to make sure this is our combination that we need to use. Again, 30 to 45 seconds in one spot, moving just about an inch either direction to season your pad. My towel, wipe lightly. Okay, I can clearly see there's a difference. This side got rid of more of the scratching, scratches that were in the hood. Uh, we didn't cause any more hazing. If this side would have gotten hazing and the scratches were gone, then you would have known it was too aggressive for what the surface needed. It would have went to probably the yellow and the yellow DA pad. This hood is pretty marked up. This thing's been washed several times to a car wash by hand. Um, it's got a lot of miles on it. So I'm thinking a, a compound step would be good. So we are gonna do the first half of the hood, compound it, and we'll come back and polish it with the yellow DA foam pad and the yellow product, a one, two, and it should look pretty good and we're done. Uh, moving forward, once you've seasoned your pad, in between adding product, I always take an air gun and fluff up my pad, or I take my tool and I fluff the pad up this way. Once your pad has been seasoned, take your pad, I always shake the product, good habit to get into. I put a small T across like that. That's it. That's all it takes. Turn your buffer over. Put the buffer on the surface before you start buffing and then turn it on. I'm going to bump my speed up to about three once I get going, three and a half, knowing this hood has got some scratches. I will probably do just the front half just so we can kind of compare old from new and keep it right on top of each other. I did that edge a little bit extra because I didn't quite go down all the way the first time. I have got my compound pad with my compound. I'm going to wipe softly. Again, your lighting almost works against you inside a building. Those lights magnify whatever marks. This hood looks really good. If we were to move it out in the sun and look, you'd see nothing left behind. So we have clearly compounded the scratches out gotten rid of any, we call them grocery sliding bags, any of those kind of marks, car wash marks and the wash brushes. 
I'm going to do this foot up to about here with this compound and then we are going to polish the bottom half and just kind of see the difference of what it has. Again, before I add product, I always take my tool, fluff up my pad, get all the old contaminants out of the pad. If you use an air gun, what you're doing is blowing all the dead clear coat, any contaminants you may have picked up, mainly just basically dead clear coat. The pad has been seasoned, we've been using it. Small T. If you get done and you find a scratch that kind of sticks out more after you've compounded, you can always go back, turn your, put a little product on your buffer, turn it up to speed five maybe. Work on just that scratch if there's one still kind of left behind that's pretty evident and get rid of it that way. A lot of the guys in bigger shops that try to do a one step buff on a car will actually go through, identify the scratches. A lot of them will use a piece of tape, a little product to put a little compound on the paint, little dots. They'll go through, they'll buff those products out with the blue wool and the blue product, wipe it down and then come back over and do a full one step with the yellow to eliminate having to do a full two step on the vehicles. And that works pretty good with today's paints. Um, it's a lot easier to do that than have to compound the whole entire car if you've just got a couple bad spots. And those are usually on the edge of fenders on each side, the trunk lids where, including myself, have a tendency to set stuff down or set it down and then drag it into your car. Compound those areas and then come back with your yellow wool and the yellow polish, the fine, and do a complete once over on the whole car. 99% of the time, that's all you need to do. It's just these top surfaces that get kind of hammered from us putting things on them. So with this car hood, this looks really good. So I'm going to come through now and we won't use the wool. We will use the DA foam and I'll show you how to season a foam pad. Again, before I put my pad, take my pad off, I always clean it with an air gun or this claw. And I do that to get in the habit your pads will last a lot longer if you actually clean them before you put them away and they'll work a lot better. When you're using the two wool pads, I tell my customers, mark one, two, three, and four. Use four pads per vehicle. Divide your car up into four. The first section, use pad number one, depending on what pad you're using. Go about one fourth of the way. When you get done, take it off, clean it, take it off, set it aside, grab your second pad. Today's pads are kind of made like a memory foam pad. If I were to start cutting this pad with this, this car with this pad here, by the time I get all the way to the front, it's not gonna be working on that side. People were trying to figure out why they have hazing, why, there's, why they can't get it to shine up. That's 100% the reason is because they're not rotating their pads out. This has a memory foam. If you go all the way around the car, this foam is gonna get crushed down. It's gonna get hot. It's gonna start breaking around the edges. That you do not want. It's an overstressed pad. So again, four pads per car, whether it be either one of the wools. The foam, I pretty much use the same foam for one car. You can get away with that very easily. Again, rotate your pads. So we are going to come back and finish this half with the yellow polish and a yellow foam pad. I will show you how to season the pad. And afterwards, I'll explain the three step, one step, and all the different steps that are needed or you need to take. Center your pad on the buffer, shake your bottle up well to season the, the foam pads with the Rupa system. This is a six inch pad, so you're gonna take and put six dots the size of your pinky, pinky nail on that pad because it's a six inch pad. If it was a five inch, you'd put five, a three inch, you put three. One easy thing to remember when using the DA foam pads with Rupus. I've taught hundreds of classes on people over the years and thousands of, I've literally taught thousands of people in 35 years. The number one complaint to detailing anything is, I'm afraid to buff. With the Rupus system, you don't have to be afraid. You can, I like taking people who have never buffed a vehicle in their life before and use them in my class. If I'm doing a class or I'm teaching a dealership how to buff, you don't need to know how to buff. You just need to know how to season your pad and what to look for and how to move your buffer around it's not like the old days with the rotary buffer where you can swirl or burn on edges. I mean, you would have to literally try to wreck a hood with this system. That's why it's so nice in dealerships. You don't need to know how to buff to make a black vehicle or a dark vehicle look great. So again, we put in six dots the size of my pinky nail. 
on a foam pad, you're going to flip the pad over, you're going to turn it down to one, and you're going to move it around for 30 to 45 seconds. You're going to season the pad and disperse the chemical properly. We did not spread it with a knife like we did on the wool pads because foam, it does spread evenly in a foam pad, where wool, it kind of hangs onto the fibers and doesn't want to spread unless you spread it for it. So again, we're going to turn it down to one and season it. The pad is now seasoned. The product is dispersed evenly amongst the pad. So moving forward, when we add product to the pad for the rest of the car, you're going to add two dots the size of your pinky nail. That's it. A very little bit goes a very long ways. I love the yellow foam pad and the yellow fine because I say it's like a hot knife going through butter. It just flows so evenly. As long as you're leaving a haze, you are good to go. So two dots can literally do most of this hood. Uh, it doesn't take very many to go around the car and that's what people will come to notice that you will go through a lot less product using this system than you do any other system. So turn your pad over. I'm going to put it on one. Once it gets going, I'm going to turn it up to three. So one thing you may have noticed when I was doing this, when I came down, I didn't stop at the edge for edge because in reality, the edge is where this backing plate is. So that's why I overlapped a little bit. You don't have to worry about burning. So I, I went over the edge and then came back. I didn't run this way and burn down on the edge. I passed over it and gradually brought it back. Same thing with edges here in the thing. You'll see the pad. You'll learn how to kind of tip the pad on the surfaces. You won't really swirl or burn. Um, but keep your pad, as long as you're leaving a haze, you've got plenty of product. So not without adding any more, I'm gonna do this edge just cause I'm right here right now. So now we've got yellow product Different microfiber pad than I was using with the blue. Taking four way across it, just kind of wipe evenly, smoothly. You don't have to scrub it off. As you'll notice, this side of the hood, we've done a two step, looks amazing compared to that side. That side is, I mean, it's got scratches, it's got car wash, it has car wash marks, it's got bugs burned into the clear. This side looks great. And, and we're under shop lighting. If we move this outside, this side will be flawless. We basically two-stepped it. The next thing I'm going to show you is Rupus Uno Protect. It is a one-step product. It's a compound polish sealer built in one. You can have it change what you want it to do by changing the pad. If you want it to cut more, use a cutting pad. If you want it to polish more, use a polishing pad. If it's kind of in the middle and the car doesn't look too bad, then I would use this one. Um, I'm going to use the yellow one with the Uno Protect just so you can kind of see the difference between a two-step and a true one-step. Again, I'm going to clean my pad off with an air hose or this tool before I take it off. Use my tool to get in between the Velcro and the foam. Put on my yellow wool. Put my finger over the hole, shake it. So I know you've seen me setting this on the hood. Um, I'm only doing it because we know the owner of the car and it's just, I'm just using it as a demo purpose. Generally, guys will have a cart by them and I didn't want a cart in the videos and have to keep turning and without talking to the camera. So yes, I know we don't set anything on the hood. I could put a towel down and set it down like that, which is probably the proper way. But again, I know who owns this car and he didn't care. He's getting a bonus. He's getting me to buff it for nothing. So we put Uno Protect on the pad. We're going to turn it over. We're going to turn it down to one and season it. I'm just putting a T on. I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to turn it on with one. Then I'm going to bump it up to three while I'm going. I'm just going to do this part here as a one step so you can see the comparison difference.
One of the tricks to Uno Protect and Uno, Uno Advanced is to leave it on the surface for 30 to 45 minutes before you wipe it off. It'll wipe off easier. The, the chemical using it is doing something right now as it's sitting on here. So they say 30 to 45 minutes. Sometimes like when I'm doing a class, I'll take an air gun and I'll blow it on there just to kind of speed up the drying process a little bit because we, we don't have 30 to 45 minutes to stand here and look at products dry on a surface. So again, 30 to 45 minutes. I'm gonna use a new towel. So I can see it from the point of the angle I'm at. This side has got a deeper, less marked up surface than this. This hood is beyond using a one step product. Now we can come back, we could compound with this, with the blue, and then come back and use Uno Protect on the whole thing. There are lots of guys that do that, just because it leaves a super slick surface. It's a great product, so it can be used as a second step to a two step system. Um, some of the darker colors in like the new GMs, some of the Subarus, I know Toyotas have a weird paint on them too. Uno Pier was developed to make dark sided cars. Um, when you just need that little extra pop and it's kind of dull and it doesn't look like it's popping out at you, you can take this with a white foam pad, buzz over it and that, what this has got in it just makes it pop, makes it shine, makes it go past that little bit. I, if I could just get it a little bit more, you don't want to keep working the surface because again, you're going to start hazing it from over buffing. This actually makes it pop out pretty decent. Um, one thing I mentioned on my buffer is the little line. So if I were to turn this buffer on and I don't do anything but just stand here and hold it, it'll look like there's about six to eight of these. If I lean onto it just a little bit, put a little bit of pressure, it's gonna look like I have an O. That means it's, it's putting pressure right there. It's showing me where I'm putting the pressure. If I'm doing this and it stalls out, a lot of times it'll look like this will stop because it's no longer doing the spinning, it's just doing the vibrating. So this will actually stay stationary. If I'm pushing down a little bit too much, this will start to look like there's a bunch of them in one area. This just helps them keep that mental block that if they see this getting bunched up, they're pushing or they're leaning. You tell people don't lean, you'll see them buff like this all the way across. Well, when you're making your cross, hat, your cross lines, you're only gonna have a line to work with about like that. If this pad is flat, you're gonna have a circle like that to work with. And you're gonna to wanna to overlap 30%. If you're on your side, you literally are overlapping that much because you, you don't have as much of a surface. For example, there's a nice circle. Here's a side buff. It's half the size. So again, keep it flat. You're gonna cover more area. You're gonna do a better job and cause yourself less work later. Headlights, you guys do a lot of headlights. So you guys are using Eagle sandpaper right now for that, the dry paper. Just to give you an idea, this is Eagle sandpaper here, just like you have up there. This is little tiny pieces of it though. And they fit on this little tiny block. So when you're doing a headlight, like this one, and you're getting into these little tiny areas, and it's hard to get in there with your sander, with your three inch, you can do this with this little block right here. Works great. Takes all the risk out of getting in there and doing something bad over here. Fits in anywhere. The other thing you can do with this is if you have a transfer mark, like on that Wagoneer, so this right here, that's a transfer mark, meaning it's a rub. So it's not actually through the clear, but it's what is caused by two surfaces abrading each other. It's not even necessarily a scratch. So this little tiny piece of sandpaper fits perfectly right there to sand that out a little bit. This sandpaper is, is incredibly easy to use. The learning curve on it is very small because you're dry. If you're sanding with wet paper, meaning you've got a whole bunch of water on the surface, a couple different things can happen. One. You can't really see what you're getting because there's a bunch of water in the way and that water turns white because you're removing the clear and that's what's called slurry. The other thing is with water, you start to hydroplane with sandpaper. That's when you get real uneven sanding patterns. With this, because it's dry, you can do little tiny areas. And I will tell you that in some cases, sanding will yield better results than buff, 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 buff. So a real light sand to the point where you're not going through the clear or anything like that, and you won't, because this is 3,000 grit. Five minutes of straight sanding like this to go through the clear, that's how mild 3,000 grit is. But what it does is transfer marks like that, you eliminate just that little tiny area because your block is this big, as opposed to putting on a machine like this or using your fingers with a sheet of sandpaper. So this is something every shop should have because that will be easy to sand out, and then when you buff that door, it's gonna look like a million bucks. The hardest thing that you guys will ever have to do 
is test spot. Once you test spot and figure out how to do that and get the results you want, the rest of it's easy. Quality of towels. I am a towel guy. Contamination of towels is what causes problems with windows, causes problems with ceramic coatings, all those things. Towels are everything. Because when you're doing this step right here and you grab a towel that's crappy, or it's got steel wool in it because somebody, or tar, and you do that, that's a problem. Make sure the buffing towels are the highest quality ones. The interior cleaning towels, buy the cheapest ones you can. The ones you're gonna use on the wheels, buy the cheapest ones you can. Spend your money on the exterior towels and glass towels. So one thing we didn't talk about with glass, you guys get water spotting on glass frequently? Water spots in windows and paint are not buffable. You can buff them till they're gone, but they're still there. Because unlike a scratch, so a scratch is this. That's a scratch. That's an actual abrasion. A water spot is actually a chemical reaction. And when you look at it under a, a, magnifying, or a, a magnification, it actually looks kind of like a little volcano. So what it is, that chemical has caused that clear coat to have that spot in it. And that spot is a chemical, not an abrasion. So when we are buffing, remember, we're removing micro layers or micro amounts of clear coat. So when you buff a car that has water spots, they may go away but they're gonna be back in two, three, four, five, six weeks because they're still there. That chemical is still there. So to truly eliminate water spots, to get rid of them for good, you have to use a low pH acid-based water spot remover. So that's why water spots are such a problem and they keep coming back. So if you're not using water spot remover, you wanna have it, but talk to him about how to use it once you get it and he can show you because it's your best friend in the world to remove water spots or at least eliminate them enough where you can get them to a point where they're almost gone because water spots are tough but if it's used incorrectly it can damage things know this anyone who tells you that you can buff off water spots is wrong you're not buffing a scratch you're buffing a chemical reaction so one thing too showroom shine which is what you guys use um, if you guys are buffing and you have a car that has a whole bunch of little areas if you're not going to use a piece of cardboard or you need to just do a quick spot. One thing that works really well is when you spray in this product. So say customer says, hey, that little scratch right there, I want that off. Okay, well, you may not want to tape all this off or go through that whole process. What you can do is you can take showroom shine and spray it in there. What this will do is it will stop that compound from turning into that hard product and you can just wipe it away. So showroom shine doesn't really have much in the way of protectant in it. Showroom shine is really just a Lubricant, clay lubricant, fingerprint eraser. What we do have though that you guys will want to look into. So this is a new product that's out and this is a spray ceramic. This product has a ton of shine to it and a ton of protection. This is gonna be better than probably anything else on this table as far as longevity and protection goes and it's super easy to use. So that right there, what I've done, that's enough protectant to keep this car out in the lot for three months and you never have to do that again protected from bird droppings, acid rain, all those things. That product is probably better than most of your hand waxes that we used to use long ago. And it takes minutes, not hours. Specialty adhesive remover, we designed it to be 100% safe on any glass, paint, plastic, trim, anything. I've never in all my years seen it wreck anything. And keep in mind that I've worked for Stinger for four years, but we sold the products for 10 years before that. So that's 14 years of not ever seeing it cause a problem. I hope you've enjoyed the video so far. We're gonna go into the final two steps is exterior dressing. Um, you're gonna to wanna to use a tire dressing. Uh, I like this one, it's a no sling. You put it on with a tire applicator. You've got other dressings for the outside. If you use a water-based silicone, you won't get the dirt collecting to it. You can use any one of our applicators to touch up the moldings, mirrors, bumper trim, anything plastic or rubber. The exterior dressing, you want to check the door jams, you know, just make sure all the dressings are on the, the trunk and the hood and the doors are all dressed on the exterior dressing also. Make sure they weren't missed. And then the final step is the final inspection. This I highly recommend somebody else other than the person who cleaned the car doing the inspection. And it isn't to make fun of the guy if he missed something, it is so you have a second set of eyes looking at the car rather than the guy who cleaned it because he thinks it's perfect, that's why he's done. The other guy can look for like when you move the seat front and back, make sure that seat track is clean, door jams, the rubber along the windows, speakers, uh, down in the cup holders. Cup holders are a, a big problem. People don't seem to get those clean. I always check those. 
you open your hood and your trunk, make sure that lip around the outside is clean. There's not dirt still up in there that you may have missed in the wash bay, but final inspection is an important one. We do offer a final inspection sheet on our website that you can print off. It has steps while doing it and then steps while you check it, make sure it's been checked and double checked. You're repeating yourself and if you do it the same way each time, less things will get missed later down the road. You can find this flyer under the resources and FAQ section of our website. Uh, click those and you'll be able to find a button to print it off. And now here are some questions that were asked during the training seminar. So acid will not break down plastic. What it does to the sprayers is there's a spring inside of there and once it, that seal breaks, the acid seeps into that chamber where the spring is and it eats that spring because it eats metal. That's what acid does. So it's the plastics are fine. It's the spring that goes. If you really want to make sprayers last, what you do at the end of the night is take them all out of the acid and just soak them in a little bit of all clean in your sink, just like a little tiny bit of all clean. So all clean or black scorpion neutralizes acid. So one's a low pH, one's a high pH. And when you put them together, they neutralize and they make the acid inert. So pad maintenance 101 is, this is the absolute far and away best way to clean a pad. If you have a tornado and you turn the fluid off, you can certainly use that too and do it that way. That's a great way to clean them. In fact, the recommended way that Rupus has to clean their pads is to use a tornador with no solution in it. So use your tornado gun. That way it, it actually goes through the pads and twists that fiber around in there, cleans them. They will get to a certain point where you want to throw them in the washing machine with just a little bit of our laundry detergent, take them out, let them air dry. If you throw them in the dryer, this is wool. Have you ever taken a wool sweater and threw it in the dryer? So it used to fit me, now it fits a two-year-old. That's the same thing that happens to this pad. If your pads look like that, throw them away. So here's, what, here's how you make your pads last. And this is something I should have actually went through with you guys right there. So if we're buffing this whole entire vehicle, I'm gonna clean my pad on this hood four times. I'm gonna separate this hood into four sections. I'm gonna buff this, I'm gonna clean my pad, I'm gonna buff that, I'm gonna clean my pad, buff that, clean my pad, buff that, clean my pad, move on to the next part. When I get about a third of the way through this big vehicle, I'm gonna take my pad off, I'm gonna clean it, take it off, stick it underneath my stool or on my cart or whatever, and I'm gonna take a new pad that I haven't used. It doesn't have to be new, new, not like out of the package, but just one I haven't used, and I'm gonna to continue to buff because what happens with pads, this little glue back here, once that continues to heat up, it starts to break down this back of the pad right here. This foam, when it continues to get used, it will heat up and that foam starts to deteriorate. So if you are using your pads and rotating them, not meaning open up brand new ones all the time, just rotating them, you can get 10 cars out of a pad if you're careful. You know, the thing about a buffing pad is, their buffing pads are not cheap nowadays, but neither is spending four hours buffing a car. You know, you cost more, in everything in this shop, you sitting here in front of me, are the highest expense in the whole entire shop. So salt, what you wanna do is a brass brush. When it's dry, so before we get the water in, take a brass brush and rub the salt and start to break it up. Because salt basically creates a rock once it gets wet. So when you get in carpet, in some cases it turns into a, a rock-like structure. In some cases it actually melts the carpets, depending upon what type of carpet it is. But what you wanna do is take a brass brush and you'll wanna hit it with the brass brush like this, just go across it and briskly rub it and then hit the brass brush on it, start breaking it up. And then usually at that point, you can take a hot water extractor with super hot water and pull it out of there. So ceramic coatings are not, you know, when the first ceramic coating I ever sold, the guy goes, well, this stops scratches, right? And I'm like, sure, I don't know, this is 2016 or something like that maybe even earlier than that. Ceramic coatings do not stop scratches. What they do is they create an extra hard layer that the scratch isn't gonna go through. So usually it's just a surface abrasion that needs to come out. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can bring more videos like this to you and other detailers out there. And again, thank you for watching this first edition of Detailing by the Numbers.